everybody, my name is Injun Moon and welcome to I Home Church. We hope that everybody is having a beautiful and a fantastic weekend. And uh, in honour of such beautiful weather where we can really take in uh, the beauty of all of creation, I would like to speak on the theme of um, how do I feel God in my heart? Um, this is one of the questions that I get quite often whenever I talk to um, brothers and sisters all around the world. And uh, especially during these incredibly difficult and tumultuous transition times of our movement, it is indeed a good question to ask every once in a while. Um, and you know, my husband and I, uh, we've also asked ourselves these questions too. But sometimes uh, what we like to do is to take a long walk. Uh, we live uh, close by to this beautiful park. So we love to go on uh, long walks uh, with our kids and uh, really kind of use that time as a time of meditation and reflection and really being grateful for so much beauty that God uh, bestows onto our lives. And when we take these different trails on these long walks, uh, there are many little streams that we come across and bubbling and, uh, you know, burbling and gurgling with excitement. And it's almost as if the streams want to talk to us about um, their relationship with God. And it's just a beautiful sight to behold. And of course, uh, along the way, not only do we encounter, you know, gurgling uh, and bubbling uh, little streams and, uh, and brooks, but sometimes we can find um, little reservoir or puddles of water that have really kind of been sitting there for quite some time. And it's, uh, it looks quite muddy, it looks quite swampy, uh, mosquitoes are having a heyday on it, but you don't really see much else. Um, and so when I come across uh, these still waters, um, I often kind of use that as a metaphor for sometimes all, many of the periods that we go through in our life of faith. Um, sometimes our life of faith is filled with incredible excitement, incredible moments of hope. But then at times we have to kind of endure and persevere through these periods of still water when basically we feel that our world is just stagnating and it is dying and uh, we, we cannot see through it. The water is not transparent. It's murky and it's it's really depressing at times and um and at times like that you know how do we as uh, sons and daughters of god uh, maintain uh, our hearts of gratitude um continue to exercise um you know living for the sake of others and really being that men and women of true love and how do we ultimately kind of inspire and empower ourselves um, by tapping in to the divine or to our heavenly parent? Well, father shared with us this um, wonderful quote many years ago. Uh, my father, the Reverend Sam Myung Moon, he says, The human body is God's holy temple. It is God's dwelling place. You will know this when you enter a mystical state and call out, God! And he replies, here I am, from within you. When you ask in this way, the answer comes not from the sky, <laughs> but from your heart. And this is a beautiful quote, because many times we're looking for God anywhere else but uh, within ourselves, which is the dwelling place or the holy temple or the room where God wants to reside forever. And so, you know, uh, a good reminder for me is to ask myself, you know, okay, so my heart is supposed to be the dwelling place of God. It's supposed to be kind of like the holy temple. So how should I be in terms of maintenance of my heart. When we want to invite an incredibly important guest to our home, what do we do? 
Well, there are a couple steps that most of us do. And I think those steps are incredibly important also in our life of faith and also in the maintenance of our incredible relationship that we have with God. And um, so we can start out by asking a simple question. Do you or do I have room in our hearts for God? And one of the things we need to ask ourselves, number one, is, is the room clean? Is it clean? Is it pollution free? Is it uh, negativity free? Um, has the negative molds and, um, you know, heavy dust and icky, yucky uh, spills, have that been cleaned up in really preparation uh, to have God uh, as a guest in our room or our hearts? And we realize that uh, this question is a very, very important one because many times we want to know God, we want to feel God, but we don't go through the process of practicing how to prepare for God. And so when we ask ourselves, um, is the room clean? Um, a good uh, example to keep in mind is this fantastic movie years ago. Um, the movie was called Karate Kid. And it was about this young guy, you know, he wants to learn uh, the power of the martial arts and he wants to be the cool kid, he wants to be the hot stuff and he doesn't want to be bullied anymore. So he seeks out the sensei in town and he goes to learn uh, karate. But to his dismay, and to his disappointment, when he goes to learn karate, what does the sensei do? He doesn't put him in a in a in a key or in the uh, the uniform that maybe the karate kid wanted to have from day one. Uh, but the sensei asks him to basically uh, go out into the parking lot and start cleaning, wax on and wax off all the cars, the lid of the cars and the exterior of the cars. And uh, even though the karate kid, you know, he's a little bit um, perplexed why he needs to do these things, um, he does so. But then when he s starts to build up complaining and resentment and, you know, voices his, his resentment to the teacher, the teacher shows that wax on and wax off, all that motion that is used in cleaning the hub or the exterior of the car is the very motion that you will utilize in your karate form. And so we realize that, you know, when we wax on and wax off in our room uh, or our hearts where we really want to invite God, we realize that we have to practice um, this preparation in our lives in order to really honor God in the proper way, making sure that all the dust and the mold and the spills in the room or in our holy temple uh, is cleansed away. And the second question uh, we need to ask is, is there enough space or room? Um, when we look at many of the hearts of men and women out in the world, we realize that many times our hearts look like um, our modern day self storage units. Um, it's a place where we just uh, throw in all our junk and all our baggage and don't want to think about it, but we'll pay the monthly fee to keep that storage going. But this is where we want to park all our baggage and all our all the things that we have accumulated in life. And sometimes these self storage units are a wonderful thing, but they can also be a burden if we don't take time to clean it out and really ask ourselves, does our heart look like a self storage unit when God opens um, our unit? I mean, is there really going to be room for God to dwell or is there simply no room? Is God going to open? and then close because there simply has not uh, been time where um, we had a chance to really kind of sort through all our baggage. And sometimes our baggage are the kind of memorabilia that we want to keep, but sometimes they're not the best kind of uh, baggages. Sometimes they're mounds and mounds of resentment that refuses 
to allow us to empty out our storage unit. And sometimes when that resentment and uh, pain and uh, difficulties that we continue to carry through our lives, there is simply no room for God. So when we're scratching ourselves in the dark saying, where are you, God? I cannot feel you because you're not in my heart. Well, many times we are the one to blame in that we haven't really taken the time to let go. We have to practice how to let go in order to create room for God in our self-storage units and really allow a space um, that is inviting. And the third question that we need to ask ourselves is, is it comfortable? Is our temple, is our room comfortable or is it peaceful? Um, we want authentic uh, relationship with God. We want a genuine and a true relationship with God. But uh, many times are we willing to really have God in our hearts without having God to deal with our emotional volatility. Many times we're angry at God. Many times we're challenging God. Many times we're blaming God for all sorts of things. We need to ask ourselves, is our heart Zen enough um, to really invite God in? And if we were to ask ourselves honestly, um, I think many times in different phases of our lives, we would have to we would have to answer no. It is not a Zen place many times. Our hearts are going through the throes of trials and tribulations and the emotions are going up and down and many times we're on the verge of a volcanic eruption and many times we're in the depths of uh, the murky bottom uh, of, of the still water that we cannot get ourselves out of. And at the same time, we're blaming, why can't I feel God? Because we really have not taken the time to practice how to care for this room that will be the dwelling place of God in our hearts. So we realize that these couple steps, you know, to, of remembering, is it clean? Is there enough space? Um, is it comfortable enough? Are the very questions that we like to ask, for instance, when we go on trips and we're, and we're ho hoping to book a fantastic hotel and a nice place to stay. We want to know if it's clean. We want to know if it's ample room for our family. We want to know if it's going to be comfortable. Well, the same thing are the, th are the concerns that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about inviting God into our room or our hearts. And so what I like to do is, well, <clears throat> my life uh, as a, uh, somebody coming from a public family, you know, the Reverend Moon's family and the Unification Church and being in the true family and all of that, yeah, there's a whole lots of things going on. And uh, so I always remind myself these three things. And I love the third one where I ask myself, is my room or is my heart Zen, Zen-like? Is it inviting? Is it calm? Is it peaceful? Uh, because that's the reason why I had to I had to marry my husband. You know, his, his last name is Lauren Zen. <laughs> he, he is somebody that brought Zen into my life. And, um, and what I need to do in a daily basis um, with all the blessings that God gave me is to remind myself, you know, how do I maintain this heart? And we realize that in order to keep our room clean, we need to practice um, how to prepare. We realize that in order to um, make sure that there's ample space, we need to practice learning how to let go of some of our storage or some of our baggage. And we realize that um, when we want to ask ourselves, well, is our room comfortable? And is it Zen-like? Is it peaceful? Well, we realize the importance of practicing how to care. If thought needs to go into different furnishings of our room, if thought needs to go thinking about the other, will the other coming to our room be comfortable? Will they be supported? Will they be in a loving environment? And these are the things that we need to keep in mind.
And so a wonderful way to do all of these things is to really practice the philosophy that my father, the Reverend Sam Myung Moon, really shared with all of us, and that is living for the sake of others. When I think about the still water, and when I think about how, when we're left to our own devices, these puddles, many times we're like these puddles of water. You know, we're supposed to be the life-giving water, really sharing with the world, really flowing with God's grace. Um, but sometimes when we are cut off from the very source um, or oxygen that is kind of like true love from God, then we turn in to these pockets or these pools of still water. And we become so because we're not connected to God. We're not connected to that source of that constant flow of oxygen. And we realize that <clears throat> when we are kind of taken in by all of these difficulties of life and burdened and weighed down without learning to clean, without learning to let go, make room, without practicing caring for other people, um, that we would do with any room of the house, we realize that, that very, very quickly we can turn into still water. So how do we get ourselves from still water to be that living water of life for God and for our true parents? We do that through practicing true love. So even when we're not feeling it, brothers and sisters, even when we're feeling crummy, when we decide to just do simple acts of kindness, simple acts of love, to the people that are incredibly important in our lives. Good things start to happen. Um, Father has often talked about um, keeping our hearts a dwelling place of God, kind of like in this vacuum state. The problem of humanity is that we don't have enough room for God in our, in our hearts or in our dwelling place because we are so bottled up and storaged up <laughs> to the tea. But we have to kind of keep this kind of a vacuum in our hearts so that um, it kind of allows God to fill that vacuum. So how do we, <clears throat> how do we create this kind of Zen-like vacuum in our hearts to invite God into our hearts? We do so by living for the sake of others. We do so by doing incredible acts of kindness or even random acts of kindness, taking all of our pain and suffering and not just residing in it, not just turning into still water in it, but with our 5% responsibility, with our effort, be proactive. Even if we're not feeling it, love somebody. Even when we don't feel happy, try to make somebody else happy. Even when we are in pain, Try to give somebody pleasure. And in being that outward person, we are creating this wonderful Zen-like vacuum in our heart that allows God to come in. Because everything in life is uh, like a circular motion. It's give and receive. And if we're just standing there like still water, you know, being burdened by all of our personal problems and our personal burdens, but at the same time, not allowing ourselves to create a constructive exit and therefore allowing God to come and really occupy or dwell in our hearts, then we turn into still water. But despite what we're going through, if we can continually give of ourselves and create this Zen-like vacuum in our hearts, then God comes in and replenishes it. And so by helping others, we can feel extraordinarily alive. And in this way, we realize the more we give, the more we become alive. And so our faith literally becomes real by practicing living for the sake of others. So brothers and sisters, we have to realize that we are living in an incredibly important time and an incredibly blessed time. How many times can men and women of history claim that they're living in the time of the completed testament age together with our true parents? Not too many, but you and I are the lucky ones. And so when Father shares um, that um, uh, in Chun Sung Gyeong, uh, fa my father, the Reverend Sam Myung Moon, said, God, the Lord of hope, faith, and love, guided human history 
through Old Testament age, which represents hope, the New Testament age, which represents faith, the completed Testament age, which represents love. So we realize when we study the Bible that we have the Old Testament, and then we, with the, with the coming of Jesus, we have uh, the New Testament. And now with the coming of true parents, we have the completed Testament. And in the Old Testament, um, we were guided by, by law and by following and obeying God's law, we could relate to God in a certain way. And the stories of the Old Testament are very much characterized by God as the God of judgment. But with Jesus Christ and the New Testament, we are given uh, the new message or the gospel. And we come to realize um, the importance of the golden rule, do unto other as you would have, do, have them do unto you. And uh, the New Testament is characterized instead of God's judgment on us being servants and just following and obeying the law. God, uh, Jesus introduced uh, this, this new thing called brotherly love and introducing God as the Father. So we are introduced to God as the Father figure for the first time. But here in the completed Testament age, we have the philosophy of living for the sake of others. It's not just doing good unto others as, the, as you would have them do unto you, but it's going a step further. Regardless of what people do, that does not define or um, determine what we are going to do. We are going to be the proactive one. We are going to be the one reaching out, living for the sake of others. And our good uh, actions are not contingent on others being good to us or the promise of others being good to us. But we are going to give regardless. And that's an incredibly beautiful thing. And so where does that kind of thinking come from? It comes from an understanding that unlike seeing God as the God of judgment and uh, God as only the Father, we realize that God is a parent and we are God's sons and daughters. So the completed Testament age is really, really represented by the time of true parents. It's the true parents that are going to really kind of um, save the world. And why? Because through true parents, you have a family. We have a chance through this incredible thing called the blessing or the holy matrimony um, to really graft on to God's lineage um, and become part, literally, of God's family. So it's not just an understanding of uh, brotherly love, loving others as you would have them love you or understanding uh, God as the father. But now we understand God as the heavenly parent. And we realize that the New Testament is not complete because it only tells uh, the unidimensional relationship of father and the son. But what about um, parent and the daughter? What's about father and the daughter? What about mother and the son and mother and the daughter? That's why having true parents, you know, men and a man and a woman, victorious son and a victorious um, daughter, victorious Adam and a victorious Eve, really being that example couple through which the precious blessing comes through and all of humanity can graft onto it, graft onto it and become part of God's lineage. This has never happened in the history of humankind. So it's an incredible, incredible time. So regardless of how much difficulty our church needs to go through in order to kind of go through this process of transition, going through the different growing pains, we have to understand the incredible importance of the sanctity of true parents. And we must not make the same kind of mistake that the Israelites made. You know, we wanted a Messiah, so God sent uh, the Messiah to the Israelites. But what happened? They could not unite with Jesus Christ and ultimately ended up crucifying Jesus um, to the cross. And therefore he could not complete his full mission. Fast forward 2000 years, we've been waiting for the Messiah. We've been waiting for the second coming. So God sent us uh, our true father and our true mother. And we must not make the same mistakes that the disciples of Jesus and the Israelites made now in this present time by crucifying um, our true mother, who is our heavenly representative of our true parents here on earth. 
So history tends to repeat itself. And all the questions that must have been rampant and widespread at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, which really made it difficult for the disciples and for the Israelites to understand how incredibly important Jesus Christ was, you know, made it difficult for the disciples to stand firm with Jesus Christ, regardless of what was going on, and really try their best to save Jesus Christ and fight for Jesus Christ. We are at the same time, brothers and sisters. We need to understand that at this time, we not only have the Lord of the Second Advent, but we have the Messiah. We have the true parents, a man and a woman. And at this time, there are so many people trying to divide the sanctity of true parents. Basically saying it's it's not uh, true parents uh, is not a victorious Adam and Eve. It's the victorious Adam and the wife. If we resort to that kind of understanding, we are going to be making the same kind of mistake that the disciples of Jesus Christ made many, many years ago. They thought they knew better. They thought that perhaps Jesus is not doing what they perceived Jesus should be doing. And here we are, Fast forward 2,000 years, God gave us our true parents, the true parents that we have been waiting all throughout history. And what are we doing? We are slicing and dicing to uh, different parts of our true parents and different parts of the true family, not realizing it is our job to maintain the sanctity of our true parents, maintain the sanctity of the true family, and go from there. So this is not the time. To be, in the words of Pink Floyd, comfortably numb. I think many of us uh, in our life of faith have grown comfortably numb. We are okay with not feeling. We're just going to go with it. But this is the time to realize, instead of being comfortably numb, that the best is yet to come. And despite the phases of still water that we invariably will experience in our life of faith. It is our job to make sure, just like the way a light bulb needs to be plugged into a circus tree, when we find ourselves in still water, questioning everything, calling out to God saying, I feel nothing and therefore I do not want to believe. It is our job, our 5% responsibility to hook back in to that life-generating source, the oxygen, that will really bring our still water and turn it into a burbling creek. And so it is our job to stay connected to our God and to our true parents through which we, through whom we receive this incredible blessing and an incredible chance to have a family and be a part of a, commu- of, of a community that still needs to grow. We need to grow together. And so while each and every one of us are going through different moments of still water, feeling comfortable in them, we have to remember to be plugged back into the source, to that oxygen that will turn our still water into living waters for God and true parents. So brothers and sisters, Do not seek living water elsewhere. You are the fountain of life. You are the fountain of that incredible water that the world is waiting for. God and true parents are waiting for you and me to be this incredible tribal messiahs, incredible home church all over the world to really help make this world into one family of God. So brothers and sisters, be that men and women of faith and be that men and women of hope but most of all be that men and women of true love because the greatest gift that we can give to our to our families and to the ones that we love and to the world is to really ask ourselves are we men and women of true love so when you ask the question how do i feel god in my life well start by living a life practicing living for the sake of others. So instead of feeling comfortably numb (laughs) in the life that we've been sitting in for quite some time, think about reminding ourselves that the best is yet to come. And the best is yet to come. As soon as we remember 
that every still water needs that incredible oxygen running through it to revive it and turn it into the incredible living water of life. And that is our relationship with our Heavenly Parents, God, and our relationship with our true parents. So have a great week and uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. If you have any questions and comments, please leave them below the video or go to hinjinmoon.com and use the contact form. And don't forget to subscribe to our email list. And for those of you who want to contribute to our work here at iHome Church, just click on the donate button. Thank you. Bye-bye.